so what you have here is an indication that the church is largely Gentile. Remember, the Jews were kicked out under Claudius. If you have a large group of Jews kicked out, that doesn't mean that very many of these Jews were Christians yet. I don't know how big the church was, but you know there was a, probably a small Jewish church. They left. Among them who left was Aquila and Priscilla. Okay. Now, how many of those Jews that were Christians actually ended up coming back to Rome? Well, when you go out someplace and you reestablish your home and leave, I mean, you know, likely not that many came back. Some did, some didn't. But however many came back and didn't, by the time they get back, <clears throat> what did Claudius kicked them out in something like 54? No, 49, you're right, about 49, that's correct. And they came back uh, with the uh, coming of, um, of Nero, which was in the... Um, I have to go back and look at these figures, but uh, sometime in the 50s, some, several years later, maybe seven or eight years later, you've already established a new home, new business, and, and a lot of people simply didn't come back. And we don't have any evidence that Aquila Priscilla went back. <laughs> so of the few who did go back, they came back and found that the church was different. <laughs> now they are a real small minority, and the Gentiles basically have built up a church. Now... Uh, with that in mind, we have the statement uh, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called holy, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Interestingly, using a, uh, a Greek term and a Jewish term. Charis is a Greek term that people would have used as a greeting, not peace. But what is peace? Shalom. That's the Hebrew term. So we've used both a, a Gentile and a Jewish term here uh, in this greeting, which, by the way, is significant because you'll find as we move through the book, what are we dealing with? A problem that's occurred between the whole concept of Jews and Gentiles in relationship to the issue of the righteousness of God. And that's why we have what we have. Okay, any questions now? All right, well, let's just continue then. Um, verse 8. Paul says, First, on the one hand, I am giving thanks to my God through Jesus Christ concerning all of you that your faith is being proclaimed in all the world. Which is to say that we have a, um, uh, we have a church that is pretty well known. Now, there would be something going for this church being well known. What, what, what would be the, the reasons why? Any, any reasons in particular? Because Peter was the Pope here at this time or what? Uh, what, what why is this church well known? Or Tertullian was uh, later, later second century. Correct. Yeah, we've said all of these things, but one one reason why could be because you know the people who scattered said some things about the church. But but there's something else. It's a very obvious reason why this church probably had such a predominance. Rome was an important place. It was the capital of the ancient world. And so if you are in the church of the capital of the ancient world, you get prominence just by simply you have association with the capital. Pretty standard. If you're in the major city, you get prominence, whereas people in Podunk Holler don't get noticed. You know what I'm saying? If you have a church in Alexandria, Egypt, Carthage, North Africa, Rome, Ephesus, Antioch, major, major commercial and 
political cities, you have a certain attraction that people that lived in Lystra do not have. It's just a natural way it is. I mean, you, there's an identity with that. So, uh, but notice what Paul's desire is. He says, uh, for my witness is God that I am uh, uh, serving, who the one I am serving in this, my spirit in the uh, good news of his son. Now, when Paul is, um, is, bearing, is using the word witness, he has the word martus here, one who is a witness. See. Uh, he says he makes mention always in his prayers regarding them. Sort of has interesting development here. If you look in the, those you can look in the Greek text. He says, unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers. And he uses several terms for prayer here. Uh, all stuck together. Uh, the idea of uh, requesting the word de aminos is a word of prayer. The word prosyukon here is also a word for prayer. And also the word uh, making mention is obviously indicating he's throwing all these words together. Now I was going to read the New King James here. It says, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit of the gospel, Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Uh, all it does is indicate the fact when he uses different terms like this, it, it's, a, uh, it's an emphasis that he is giving them clear indication that in every way he is concerned about them and regularly approaches God in different ways on their behalf. And that's why he would sort of pack all these together, I think. And then he says, if somehow... You know, uh, if it might uh, be in the in the will of God to come to them. So Paul has not yet, uh, we find out, been to Rome because he's going to say that he wants to preach the gospel uh, to these Romans. Of course, he gets into that later. Since I for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. Now, what do you have here? I'm desiring. Um, let's see. I was going to try to look here. Uh, in order that I might impart to you some spiritual charisma. Uh, do you think that Paul the Apostle had the ability to give out the gifts of the Spirit here? Is this what this is talking about? That as an Apostle, he was going to come to them and give them a spiritual gift, maybe tongues or prophecy or healing or miracles or something. Uh, what is he meaning here? Now, now, why do you think that in the text? Read, read it to me and tell me why you think it says that he's, he has a spiritual gift that he's going to, uh, uh, to exercise. Uh, that you might uh, be established. Yeah. Well, let's just read it again. Let's see. In order that I might impart, metado, something, a, uh, in, order, in order that I might impart uh, a spiritual gift to you. The dative is humane, to, to you. In order that you might be established. So I don't know why you would, uh, if he's saying that he's going to give a spiritual gift to them so that they could have an establishment. Uh, I, I would say that's not saying that I have a spiritual gift when I come, my spiritual gift will establish you, but, but he's going to give to them a spiritual gift. And it seems to say that to me, as I understand the text. Uh, I would suggest to you that we use the word spiritual gift to, to uh, uh, 
problematically sometimes. And that uh, this men, me, merely means a benefit. It can mean just simply a benefit. He wants to impart to them a spiritual value or benefit or help, Eric, that... No, this little thing flying around. So we may have to put a screen up. Is the front is the door open back there? Oh, maybe it's a reason. Yeah, it's the front door. Yeah. Well, I just what I'm trying to say is it could be that we are too too quick, is this on tape? Yeah. That we are too quick to say every time we see the word spiritual gift to think it's talking about the gifts of the Spirit under 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In other words, we, we read 1 Corinthians 12 into this passage. Whereas Paul could use the term in more than one way. And that he could mean here, he says, I want to give you a spiritual gift, a, a, a spiritual benefit. As a matter of fact, what's interesting is if you will take the time to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which I'll not do right now, but if you look at chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, you'll find the word spiritual gift does not occur in that passage. 12.1 doesn't say spiritual gift of any sort. It just says spiritual. And I've, I've got a whole article I write on this issue if you go to my webpage. And verse 3 of that passage doesn't say the word spiritual. It just simply says gift. See, So to take our theological statement we've done, spiritual gift, and then run to the Greek text here and see the word actual spiritual gift and say it's meaning the same thing is to actually not see what the text is doing. See, Paul never uses the word spiritual gift for what we call gifts of the Spirit. See, it's just that we have imposed it on it. Does that make sense to you? You understand where I'm going with that? So Paul, here I think he means, I hope to give you a spiritual value or benefit or help so that you can be established. Um, then he goes on that... Uh, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. So he believes that by giving them the spiritual benefit, when he comes, he's going to impart to them spiritual help and, 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 and giftedness uh, so that they can be established, so that both of their faiths can be strengthened. <clears throat> then he says... Um, in order that I might have fruit also among you, just as also among the remaining Gentiles. Paul had been traveling throughout the empire having benefit, and now he wants to make sure that when he comes to them, he also is able to benefit them even as he has other believers. And notice he says, to, <clears throat> but both to the... Uh, uh, Greeks and barbarians to the wise and to the foolish, he says, I am a debtor. Uh, the reason why he's a debtor is because he has been given a, a, a commission, an obligation, an accountability. He's, been a, he's a debtor. He's not so much a debtor, I think, to them as he's a debtor to God. See, the debt relates to the fact that he has been given a commission and he must fulfill the commission. He has responsibilities or accountabilities. Thus also then, he says, that uh, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you then who are in Rome also, which he has not done then. Well, that's the introductory section of the, uh, of the book that we're moving to. <clears throat> what we find then, according to Paul's teaching in verse uh, 14 and following, he has a mission. The mission is to all social classes, both Greeks and barbarians, all intellectual classes with both wise and unwise, and all religious classes 
or ethnic classes, maybe we should say, both Jews and to the uh, Greek. <clears throat> His motive, then, he says he's a debtor, he says he's ready, and he's also not ashamed. That's an interesting statement here. For uh, when you look at his statement here in verse, um, where is that? Verse, por first portion of verse 16. I am not ashamed. Now, I've got to say, that's a, uh, a really pricking statement. <clears throat> because I'm afraid that too often, uh, myself at least, uh, has, uh, have not always been as bold in that, as that. Uh, there have been times I've been a little timid in my life where I've thought, you know, I don't want to, you know, I won't take my Bible out, you know, or I want to. So I saw a lady on the plane uh, a week or so ago. <clears throat> I noticed she had her little romance novel. <clears throat> you could tell us what it was. Uh, stuck in some uh, cloth binding, you know, where you couldn't see the front of it. And I suspect some of us would try to hide our Bibles that way. If somebody sees you reading the Bible, they may ask you a question. You know, or something. You know, it's uh, uh, Paul said he's not ashamed of the gospel, and there's a reason why he's not ashamed because he realizes what it is and what it does. Uh, I suspect sometimes we think that uh, the gospel has no power. You know, you have you you're afraid that if you sit next to somebody who has his PhD in astrophysics, that maybe you won't be capable of carrying on an intelligent conversation, or maybe you won't be able to to answer questions adequately or this or that. Uh, Paul believed the gospel could solve the problem. Now, first of all, we have to make sure we know what the gospel is and what it isn't. And uh, we use the term very loosely sometimes. Like I said, uh, let me just read the passage here. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all those who are believing. Jews first and then Greeks. I'm going to stop there. The reason why Paul is not ashamed because it is power. The Greek word here for power is the Greek word dunamis. D-U-N-A-M-I-T-E, so to speak. Dunamite. Dunamis is the Greek word. It means dynamic. We give the word dynamic. We get the word dynamite, dynamo. It means power. It's a power unleashed. And so Paul says that the gospel is what actually has the power I think, to unleash uh, the, the work of God to bring salvation to all who believe. Obviously, salvation doesn't come to those who do not believe. It comes to those who are believing. And it's the gospel that's the power. Now, see, so that would seem to say, it doesn't say here that my eloquence is the power of God and the salvation. It doesn't say that my arguments are the power of God and the salvation. Uh, it doesn't say that all the things that I offer as far as PR and Wall Street technique is the power of God and the salvation. It's not even the way I live in front of people that's the power of God and the salvation. Now, I'm going to get into the whole issue now. We're going to roll up our sleeves and talk about evangelism. <clears throat> I'll never forget years ago, I listened to a particular person well-known and he was talking about lifestyle evangelism. And what this theory is, in case you haven't heard about it before, there's even a book called it, is that what you do is you don't pigeonhole people. You don't buttonhole people. You don't confront people with the gospel. You just live a good life in front of them. And if you live a good life in front of them, they're going to be attracted to how good a life you live, and they're going to start inquiring, why do you live such a good life? I'd like to have a good life too. And then they'll come to Christ. Well, a few things wrong with that. Uh, that's even worse than the, uh, the wordless book. Uh, the wordless book, at least you have to explain. You know, black is for sin, red is for blood. You, those are cute for kids, and I think it's fine. But words get attached to it, and content get attached to it. 
The wordless book without content would be, oh, that's pretty black, that's pretty red, that's pretty white, that's pretty this and pretty that. It's, to have a book that just has color without content is not to convey truth. See, those are merely symbols of truth that you have to give content to. I would suggest that's the same thing true with one's life. To simply have a life is not adequate. There must be content. There are lots of people, quite honestly, who live pretty decent lives that aren't Christians. Matter of fact, there's some people that live decent lives that look better than Christians. Yeah, that's true. And if it weren't for the fact that we're not saved by works, I'd say that that's, a, that's a big deal. But since we're saved by grace through faith and not of works, it's irrelevant that they live a better life than I do. It's not irrelevant in one respect, in the sense that we obviously should live better lives, but it's irrelevant in reference to salvation. <laughs> if they beat us living good lives, then f so what? They still go to hell. Because salvation is of God's grace and not of works. So I don't care about the good lives issue. Uh, there are people in other religions, even Islam and, and Buddhism and other, that... that really lived nice lives, and they even attribute it to it. I'll never forget years ago, there was a guy who was part of the Chicago Five who, uh, who converted, he said that he, uh, he, he gave up smoking, gave up you know, carousing and women, and, and uh, started dressing in a suit, did away with drugs, clean shaven, did his hair, everything looked wonderful, and he's been a different man ever since he met the Maharaji. You know, he, 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 was, he, he thought uh, that Maharaji Yogi was a wonderful person, and, he's, and he's, uh, he's changed his life. There you have it. Changed life is a sign of Christianity. It's also a sign of Eastern religion, apparently. Uh, so one thing is, the gospel is not your, te your, your change of life. That's one thing. The gospel is not your change of life. The gospel is also not your testimony. I've heard people say, I gave the gospel to them. When you ask them what they're talking about, well, I told them how that Jesus has made me different. Jesus loves me, and, 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 and my life has been, a, uh, since I've known Jesus, I've just, just been a better person. And I, things are going well. I have a new car now, new house, new wife. I mean, everything is wonderful since I've come to Jesus. <laughs> and they think that's the gospel. That's not the gospel either. Your testimony is not the gospel. Now to get to the lifestyle evangelism. So this guy was uh, living next door to this couple for about 10 years. They became bosom friends. They were over at each other's house having barbecues, eating, enjoying each other's company. And all this time he's living a good life in front of them. And if I mentioned this person's name, you'd know it. Well-known person. And what, what, what amazed me is he was giving this illustration that after he finished it, he didn't say, and boy, did I blow it. He didn't even see that he had given an example of the futility of his position. Because after 10 years, he never gave them a statement of the good news of Jesus. They moved away, he found out, within the year later after they moved, this woman was killed in an accident. Never heard the gospel from him. He had lifestyle evangelism. I think lifestyle evangelism is... A, is, 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 is I'm not saying there's not a place to live a good life in front of people. <laughs> that's certainly appropriate. That's called sanctification. But that's not a substitute for giving the gospel. It's not any va more value than the wordless book without content. Now, does that mean that you have to get out and hit people over the head? No. But I think it does mean you have to give certain content. So the issue is then, what is the good news? The good news is not about you. The good news is about Jesus. The good news is the fact that God loved the world so much that he sent his son into the world who died on the cross for our sins and that he was raised again by God from the dead and now even lives for us. That's good news. 
And that's gospel. That's content. Can a person be actually can a person actually come to Jesus apart from content? I think it's really, really unlikely. They need content. See, because it's we don't we're not saved by faith in faith. There have been people I know years ago, especially when New Orthodoxy was really running straight, because it's not so much important what you believe. It's just important that you believe. So that's like faith in faith. I just believe. Believe what? Well, just believe. Just believe, you know. The New Testament presents its faith in Christ. See? It's believing into someone. There's a that and there's a and there's a that and there is a who. I believe that he died, and that I believe in the one who did die. It includes both realities. We believe certain things to be true, and we believe in the ones about whom those things are true. Both are required. So it says, I am not ashamed of the good news, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It is what brings people to Jesus. Now, there are areas in which I could argue with people that are, in, that are intellectuals. I know there are certain areas I could argue about. I know some things about but my arguments are not ultimately what bring people to Christ. Arguments, the function of arguments in Paul's teaching is to tear down strongholds. The function of argument is to demolish those contrived and stupid arguments against Christ. But those are negatives, and they're not, they're not wrong. They're good. It's important to tear away the veneer of the argument and leave a person naked before God with no other argument. But after you strip the clothes off of this person and they're naked before God, they're as sinful and stubborn as they ever were. Ultimately, it's the gospel that brings people to Christ. Okay, And there is no substitute. And Paul says... I think that in verse 16. It's the gospel of the power of God to the Jew first, then to the Greek. For, and here we have verse 17, which is the theme of the book, for the dikasune, the righteousness or the justice of God has been revealed in it. Out of faith, into faith. Let me see exactly how they translate that here. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay? So here we have some information. The information is that in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. Now that's an issue that we've got to work with. How is it that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel? Remember, I just got through telling you that the gospel is the fact that God loved us to the point that he did, in fact, send his son, who then would become the sacrifice for our sins, the substitution for our sins, and that he rose from the dead. Where is the righteousness of God in that statement? The righteousness of God's justice. That's the thing. That's it. I mean, all of my sin, since it happened 2,000 years before I was born, all of my sin was placed on him 2,000 years ago. And I but, 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 but still again, how is that justice? Because God, if he didn't judge my sin and just ushered me into heaven and said, it's okay, I don't worry about it, that's not justice. So God's justice, his righteousness, is demonstrated two ways at least. It's demonstrating that God does not forgive sins apart from payment. It's got to be See, God is a just God. See, I said, never ask God for justice, asking for mercy, asking for grace. Never say, God, be just to me. Because justice is damnation. What I deserve is condemnation, not forgiveness. 
God, however, is becomes, as we find out in Scripture here a little bit later, he's both the just and the justifier of one who has faith in Christ. So the justice of God, when Paul says, for the righteousness of God is revealed out of faith into faith, we're going to find out here as we look in the passage, Paul develops that theme. In other words, this isn't the end of it. This is the beginning. He's now made a general statement that he's going to explicate for, for a number of chapters now. This is sort of like the theme head. That is going to tell you how that's so. But just in preparation for that, essentially what we're saying is God's justice revealed that there is a standard to which God holds us, which we in fact cannot meet, and which in fact Jesus met for us by enduring the wrath of God. That's, that's essentially what Paul's talking about here. Now, we, we can't move on into verse 18 until we seriously deal with then the just shall live out of faith. And uh, it's important then, to, if we're going to do this, according to verse 17, that we go back into Habakkuk and read that passage. How are we doing? Habakkuk, again, they would have had this book in their possession. By the way, would they have had it in Greek or in Hebrew, you think? In Rome? Greek. Greek. Yeah, Greek. Uh, very few Jews outside of Israel at this time probably read enough fluent Hebrew. That's why the Greek Old Testament, remember, was started being translated in the 2nd century B.C., was finished by the 1st century B.C. Took a little over 100 years to do. It was translated immediately. And uh, most of the Jews outside of Israel read the Greek New Testament. Uh, excuse me, the uh, Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint, LXX. You've seen that before? LXX. Um, and Paul sometimes quotes from the Septuagint. Other times he quotes from the Hebrew because Paul, being a rabbi, also read Hebrew. So that's important and we see that. The just shall live by faith. Yes? How do you know the difference? Is it just because of the words? In, in Greek? I mean, how do I know whether he is or not? Oh, I would know it right off unless I simply had a knowledge. I mean, the point of it is, what I can do, and it's not hard to do, I can get on my little computer and do it. You can run up the, uh, the passages in the Septuagint and look at it and look at the New Testament and see if they're quotes. And sometimes what you'll do, you read the New Testament Greek as a quotation of the Old Testament, and you'll look at the Septuagint, it's not even close, you know, as far as being word for word. Then what you have to do is pull up your Hebrew and see how would you translate from Hebrew into Greek to say that, and you'll find that Paul oftentimes went from Hebrew into Greek instead of Greek into Greek. That's how you know it. Um, for the righteousness of God has been revealed in it. By looking at the gospel, we've seen God act his justice out. Just as it is written, the just shall live out of faith. So let's go back to Habakkuk chapter 2. Now let's look at verse 1 to get going. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me. And what I will answer when I am corrected. Notice Habakkuk has a good attitude here. He anticipates that uh, he will be there when God gets ready to talk and that he's ready to answer back God after he has received proper information. This man is, has a sense of humility here. Then Yahweh answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live out of faith. Or by his faith, it says here. Now, think about this is the passage that Paul quotes. And uh, 
Now, we find out in chapter 4 that he will quote from the statement in Genesis about, you know, Abraham believed God and it was counted in his righteousness. This is another example of faithful believing. But this is a major passage. A just shall live by faith. What does he mean that? A just shall live. Now, the Greek here says the just shall live, will live, future actually, the just will live out of faith. Faith will be what he lives out of. Uh... But when you read this passage in Habakkuk, what's it getting at? Well, see, you have to know some historical setting for this book. What you find is that in verse 2-4, probably the proud that he's speaking of here in the context is a group of people that are coming against the people of Israel. Who are those people? Anybody know? Yeah, Chaldeans or Babylonians. Uh, the Babylonians are proud and haughty people who are going to come against the people of God here. And, uh, and you have to almost start in, verse, in chapter 1. I had a very good class, a guy called Billy P. Smith in college. We read the Minor Prophets, and that was a very good class. There's some great teaching in these prophets. But one thing you find about, they, they're interacting with the judgments that are coming against the people of Israel, and later the people of Judah, from uh, the Assyrians, formerly, and the Babylonians. The Babylonians were not able to uh, come into Jerusalem and win. Why, by the way? That was after the time of the Assyrians. Assyrians came in 722. Babylonians came in in 587. Conquered in 586. Why didn't they get into Jerusalem, by the way? Initially? They finally did. I shouldn't say, I, I mixed up in my statements. I'm sorry, I'm making a mistake. Um, I'm, I'm getting them confused. Uh, the Assyrians came in, in, uh, in Hezekiah. It was Hezekiah with the Assyrians. But finally the Babylonians did come. They came in 612, 596, no, no, 612. It's been a while. 612, 606, I think, and 587. That's when they came in, something like that. It's been a long time. But uh, the point of it is the, uh, the proud here probably refers to the Babylonians who boasted about their conquest. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. True righteousness before God is linked to genuine faith in God. Righteousness and faith are related. A proud person then relies upon his own abilities, whereas a person of righteousness relies upon God's abilities. See the distinction. I think that's what the author is getting at. But what's significant here that we need to grab hold of is that when you read verses 5 to the end of chapter 2, which is written regarding the sins of Israel, this whole chapter becomes a point of which Paul develops in Romans 1, 2, and 3. A lot of people who read Romans 1 and 2 and 3 never go back to read Habakkuk again. But remember, it's Paul who's reading Habakkuk when he makes his statement and then the statements that follow from this statement. That's something that happens also in, Exodus, in, in uh, Romans chapter 9. It's amazing that we, because I don't know, I guess we just simply don't want to read the Old Testament or what, but remember that it is Paul who read the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And when you read Romans chapter 9, you must recognize Paul is pulling out his idea of Romans 9 from Exodus 33 and 34. That's where he pulls it. And unless you read Exodus 33 and 34, you won't know what Paul is getting at. That's one thing that John Piper does here in this book in Romans 9. He demonstrates the relationship... And also an article he wrote in Journal of Evangelical Theological Society demonstrates a relationship of Romans 9 to Exodus 33 and 34 where God revealed his glory to Moses and how the glory of God relates to the whole concept of Romans 9 and its ideas between uh, some of the struggles that we'll come across later in our study. The just shall live by faith. 
Well, let's just read chapter 2 in Habakkuk, and then we'll come back to this as we study 118 following, okay? Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man, and he does not stay at home. Because he enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers him to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. So he's talking about the Babylonians here. Will not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, Woe to him who increases. Why, what is not his? How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you? And will you not become their booty? Because you have plundered many nations and all the ruin of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city of all who dwell in it. Notice how he's describing the proud and the kinds of acts the proud person does. That will become important for our study in Romans here. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high. That's very similar, by the way, to the statement in Isaiah 14 about the king of Babylon, who makes his, or actually that's also found in, uh, in Nahum, I should say, and also in Isaiah 14 that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples and sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, is it not the Yahweh of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire, and nations weary themselves in vain? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh, as the waters cover the sea. That's quoted oftentimes, but look what it's in the context of. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor and presses him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. These people are somewhat lewd. The cup of Yahweh's right hand will be turned against you, and utter shame will be on your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you in the plunder of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it? Notice the terminology here about images and carving and idols. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it? The molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it. To make mute, uh, mute idols... Woe to him who says to wood awake, to silent stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overladen with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. But Yahweh is in his holy temple, that all the earth keep silence before him. Now notice that you have two statements about Yahweh in the midst of these very degradating statements about the, uh, the, the, the proud here. One is that in the midst of all these actions, God's knowledge will cover the earth in his glory. And then in the midst of all these uh, idols, Yahweh is in his holy temple. Let the earth keep silence before him. Uh, I was trying to think what somebody did one time, quoting the fact of uh, God is in his holy temple. At all. You know, the silence there is, is a silence of recognition of judgment, <laughs> is what it is. Uh, not... Uh, not the idea of let's have a holy holy time together and just sort of be quiet before God. The quietness here is one of judgment. But notice how he ties in the various kinds of sin and evil and, and idolatry in the midst of this, which may actually give rise to some of the things you observe in chapters 2 and 3, of, uh, or actually 1, 2, and 3 in the book of Romans. I, uh, Paul was reading this passage probably as part of his preparation and writing what he did to the Romans, and I think you'll see some of that here as we get into the book of Romans. Yeah, not not very yeah, yeah very very little has changed. Very little has changed. So anyway, that gives you a description of the kinds of things I think that are in Paul's mind when he writes here. He's about to write about the uh, the wicked here in one eighteen following. 
<clears throat> okay. Any questions at this point? Well, verse 16. We all know this passage. <clears throat> I don't mean 16, I mean 18. For the wrath of God is revealed. Now, it seems like I remember something else being revealed in verse uh, 17. What is revealed there? The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel out of faith in the faith. For the just shall live out of faith. And then he goes ahead and says the same word. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who are holding down the truth of God in their unrighteousness. Now, if you look in the text here carefully, Paul, remember how I showed you before how he, he sort of loads up a bunch of words on prayer and concern. He sort of, sort of throws all sorts of words in together. He's doing the same thing. The word, the first word, let me see what the, the translation here has. But this first word is the word for um, um, uh, ungodliness, essentially, or irreverence is a, is a concept. That was someone who does not hold things in, in proper reverence which is uh, most of comic television and, you know, there's a, the, the whole concept of reverence for God is not a big trait of our culture right now. Except on, I mean, September 11th, I guess it is, in certain places. But, but generally speaking, week by week, year after year, is, is uh, <clears throat> the idea of something being holy and sacred doesn't carry a lot of weight. <clears throat> but it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, but the Greek term here is the word asebion, which is the idea of being irreverence or, uh, or something of the sort. And it's translated here ungodliness. The word God here really isn't here uh, in the Greek. And adikion, which is translated here uh, unrighteousness, the word dikaio means to, get, to be righteous. Dikaiosune means justification or righteousness. This word is adikion, which is unrighteousness of men. Now, see the contrast here. Let's get on the, on the board again as I carry my cord with me. All right, let's look at this. Paul is giving us a contrast in the text because he said, he said a couple of things, and that is you have a revelation... In verse 17, of the righteousness of God. That's verse 17. In verse 18, you have a revelation again, same Greek word, of the unrighteousness of man. Sure if it says men or man. Uh, men. Okay, the unrighteousness of men. Okay? Immediately contrasting. It's obvious these are these are big contrasts to Paul. So he says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Whereas what you find with God in His righteousness is that faith is, uh, let's see, it says, uh, out of faith, under faith. So out of faith, unto faith, So the, un the righteousness of God was revealed relates to faith. The unrighteousness of man is revealed. It relates to suppression of truth. There is a stark contrast between what's happening with God and man. Man has done something significant. Note, the text is, is very interesting here because Paul uses a term 
which means to hold down. It's like if you were in a cellar and you've got this trap door above you and you're pushing it open. And there's somebody up there who's stepping on it and, try, and, and pushing it down. Truth is wanting to get out and the unrighteousness of men is keeping it down. See? That's the, the picture you have here. So it says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the unrighteous and uh, or irreverence and unrighteousness of men who, these men, are holding down or pushing down the truth in their unrighteousness. I've told many people in the past about when I've taught social ethics, I really do believe the issue of truth is not the argument. I think it's a moral issue. People don't want truth because truth makes you then accountable. And so if you're accountable, then you're, you have to examine your life. And so the reason why a lot of people do not want to believe the truth of God is because it, it will interfere, and they know. They know it will interfere with the way they live. So if they can play this mind game of denying the truth, they do it by their unrighteous deeds. They live a life of unrighteousness and don't like to think about truth. Yes? Does that start to bring in the concept of the regenerate, regenerate and unregenerate person where the regenerate person can take those words, of, the ideas of the Bible and make that, accept that or take that into the Accountability comes in. This actually is what John talks about in 1 John. Again, I'm sort of moving ahead, but uh, John says that believers sin in the light. He says, we're not of the darkness. We've been transformed from darkness to light. And yet it says that we sin. But when believers sin, they sin in the light. And when you're in the light, the light exposes the sin. That's why we then, it can, if we admit our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because if you're sinning in the darkness, you don't see the sin. If you're sinning in the light, you see the sin and that your sin is exposed and then you have to confess it. You, you have to admit it. You, it. Confession is simply saying confess, means to say alongside or with. God says you're sinning. We say really can't hide it, I'm in the light. See, I'm in the light. I admit, you're right, I am sinning. And on that basis, there's forgiveness. An unbeliever sins in darkness and never sees light, never sees sin. And it's the same concept in John as you have here. Truth is blaring in this passage. It's not that the truth is faulty. For example, if I am blind, the fact that I can't see light does not deny that light exists. See? Light is blaring. The thing is, they're blind. And they can deny the reality of light, but it doesn't make any difference, see, because the light's still there. Truth is stark, but they are pushing it down in their unrighteousness. At the heart of most error, I think, actually is an immoral life. Uh, there's a good book to read by Paul Johnson called Intellectuals. Paul Johnson, historian, England, very fine author, did a great book on the American, history of the American people, also did a book on the history of the Jewish people. He's a very fine historian, Paul Johnson. If you haven't read him, you should take time. But Intellectuals is a book he wrote, and he looked at the people that have been the most influential thinkers in the last several hundred years, the people that have been the like Darwin and Marx and... and uh, uh, Heidegger, and other, you know, I can't remember all the ones he dealt with. He had eight or ten of them. He has various people, that, you know, and what he did, he took the time to show these are the people that ideologically have impacted the world. And yet you examine their lives and you find out the reason for their teaching largely had to do with a way to obfuscate the way they lived. So that's what we're getting at. Wherefore, Deati, the knowledge of God is manifest in them. 
for God has manifested it in them. Catch that? Paul says that the wrath of God, unlike the righteousness, see, we receive the righteousness of Christ, they receive the wrath of God. Both are revealed. Theirs is revealed in, un, in, in irreverence and unrighteousness, whereas ours is revealed in faith. Contrast again. They hold down the truth in their unrighteousness, wherefore the knowledge of God is manifest in them, for God has made it manifest. In other words, even though they deny it, it's there nonetheless. Ultimately, you can't hide the sun. And that's Paul's point. Because what may be known of God, the knowledge of God, literally the Greek is the known thing of God, but different way to translate it here. The known thing of God is obvious to them. See, it's manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. Now, now Paul, in the following verses, explains how it is that God has showed it to them. And I'm going to hold that off uh, for tomorrow night.